fresh meat. Being a woman in the horror genre can be a double-edged sword. That's mainly because, for a very long time, it was one of two categories you fell into. Victim, or you were the lucky final girl. But then in the 1980s, something changed. A figure emerged, and what a figure. Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, stepped out of the shadows and into the living rooms of many a household. She was campy, she was vampy, and she was hilarious. Elvira was the creation of Cassandra Peterson, and she would go on to become an icon in the lands of horror and TV. She would make the term horror host known around the world. I was very much into horror, but I really didn't know what a horror hostess was. And she'd do it all while not only being Elvira, but writing and producing her work as well. So settle back, darlings, and prepare for some unpleasant dreams as we shine a light on the Mistress of the Dark, and we find where in the horror is Elvira now. Cassandra Peterson was born in Kansas in 1951. Very early on in childhood, Cassandra had a horrible accident as a toddler where she was scalded by boiling water. She'd endure painful skin grafts to over 35% of her body while healing from the ordeal. It would take three months of recovery in the hospital. Cassandra said she was always drawn to the darker side while growing up. The weird and the odd captivated her as a child more than the pink and plastic world of Barbies and baby dolls. A bit of an outcast herself due to the scars that she still carried from the accident, Cassandra dealt with bullying and all that came with it. She would still gravitate towards horror and science fiction, just like many of us who found solace with the monsters and the aliens of another world. While she had anxiety due to the scarring, she still loved being the center of attention and would dance as a child every chance she could. It helped her mother and aunt owned a costume shop, so she would dress up in different characters all the time. The path was being set in front of her. Cassandra wound up dancing at the age of 14 as a go-go dancer at a gay nightclub called The Purple Cow. To this day, Elvira is a gay icon, and so is Cassandra, thanks to her support of the LGBTQ community. It was at The Purple Cow where she would wind up becoming a drag performer by helping out when one of a group of performers didn't show up. Cassandra says that the drag queens at the club helped her create a look, figure out her makeup, and basically became her best friends. At 17, Cassandra wound up getting a job as a dancer in Las Vegas. Due to her age, her parents had to sign the okay for her to perform. She'd work at the legendary Dunes Casino, living out a dream of being like Anne Margaret, whom she idolized. It was there that she met another idol, Elvis Presley. At 17, Cassandra went out on a date with Elvis, living out the dream of many a teenage girl. Cassandra says the king of rock and roll gave her some good advice, which led to her leaving Las Vegas and heading to Los Angeles. If you really want to be in showbiz, you've got to get out of this town. You just sing with me, and you've got a really nice voice. You should get voice lessons and go into singing. When you're 24 or 25, you're going to be too old to dance. You need to start thinking about a different career path if you want to stay in show business. That's the advice of the king of rock and roll. Cassandra would, during the 70s, make her way into films. In the early 70s, she wound up moving to Italy and being the lead singer of some punk bands. By chance, broke and starving, she was spotted by Federico Fellini, who was shooting the film Roma. He asked her if she wanted to be in the film, and she immediately said yes. She'd be a part of the James Bond franchise, playing a dancer in Diamonds Are Forever. She'd also work with BU movie legend Stephanie Rothman in the movie Working Girls, an exploitation flick about women and the men who make their lives hell. Cassandra headed back to the States in the late 70s and started doing gigs in clubs and discos. She'd then make one of the biggest decisions of her career by joining the comedy troupe The Groundlings in 1979. It was there she would really hone her talent and create a character that was a total valley girl. She'd also meet and befriend fellow artists like Paul Rubens and John Paragon. In 1981, LA's Fright Night Weekend Horror Show was being, well, revamped and brought back from the dead. They wanted a female host, and when they couldn't work out bringing back the vampire show, they decided to cast out for a new character. It was then that Cassandra auditioned. Originally, she had designed the look of her character to be based on Sharon Tate from the Fearless Vampire Killers, a sweetly seductive ghost vampire type. But the producers wanted to up the sexy, and so Elvira, the wisecracking punk goth goddess, was born. Elvira was vivacious, beautiful, and most importantly, she was in on her own joke. Elvira owned her sexuality and wasn't afraid to joke about her assets. She was fun and funny, and thanks to Cassandra's love of horror films, able to channel the creepy and witchy mystery of the character whenever she needed to. Elvira was iconic, and soon the world would fall in love with the cool ghoul gal. 
Elvira's broadcast was called Movie Macabre and would feature Elvira on her velvet couch introducing the films, chatting during commercial breaks, and ending the show. She'd end the broadcast with a smile, a wave, and a sultry wish of unpleasant dreams. The show was a massive hit and within a short period of time would be syndicated across the country. But even with the popularity of the show, Cassandra still wasn't getting the recognition salary-wise she was worth. But don't let the Transylvania Valley Girl Act fool you, Cassandra was a smart cookie. Over time, she got the rights to all aspects of the character of Elvira, and that meant everything with the character's likeness on it meant she got paid. Now think of all the things you've seen Elvira on over the years. T-shirts, mugs, figures, purses, model kits, beer ads, pinball machines, and more. Cassandra truly won. Oh, and don't forget the Halloween costumes and wigs. Elvira was busting out all over. Between a massive ad campaign for Coors Beer and multiple magazine covers and TV appearances, in 1988, Cassandra, along with John Paragon and Sam Egan, had a feature film called Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, a quirky and campy comedy that would be a perfect double feature with Beetlejuice. The film saw Cassandra in a dual role as both Elvira and her great aunt Morgana Talbot, Talbot being the surname of Larry the Wolfman from the Universal movies, whose witchy legacy she inherits. Co-starring the legendary W. Morgan Shepard as her great uncle Vincent Talbot, the film is hilarious and fun and a great time for fans of the vampy vixen. Through the mid to late 80s, Elvira also conquered the home video market with Thriller Video. These large box VHS editions featured Elvira hosting such classic films as the Vincent Price starring The Monster Club, Dan Curtis's Dracula starring Jack Palance, the numerous episodes of the Hammer House of Horror series. In 1984, she'd guest star in a very horror fan-friendly episode of The Fall Guy called October the 31st. The episode would also guest star genre legend John Carradine, along with all three of his sons, Keith, Robert, and David. 1985 would see Cassandra appear as the very intimidating biker gang boss in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, alongside her Groundlings castmate and friend, Paul Rubens. During the same time, DC Comics would release Elvira's House of Mystery as part of the classic series of DC horror titles. In 1986, she'd have her own holiday Halloween special on MTV featuring spooky music videos. Cassandra would play Queen Sorias in the 80s action-adventure film Alan Quartermain and the Lost City of Gold. The film would co-star Richard Chamberlain, Sharon Stone, and James Earl Jones and was part of the Canon Films Library. The Elvira Macabre marketing machine kept rolling. Three PC games were released based around the character and multiple pinball machines starting with the 1989 release Elvira and the Party Monster. In 1993, The Elvira Show had a pilot shot for CBS. It was basically the same sort of concept as Elvira's first feature film, with Elvira coming to a small town to take care of her aunt, standing out like a very gothy and glamorous sore thumb, taking on uptight neighbors and zany scenes. It co-starred her long-term collaborator John Paragon and Catherine Helmand. The network canceled the season before it even had a chance to air, after they decided it was just too odd a show, supposedly. You can actually watch the pilot on YouTube. In the mid-90s, Cassandra and John Paragon penned three young adult novels based around the character, the first of which was called Transylvania 90210. Cassandra would start hitting the horror convention circuit to massive crowds while doing appearances in costume and photo ops as well. Elvira's popularity continued to grow. In 2000, she and Paragon would write the long-awaited sequel feature film Elvira's Haunted Hills. The film was shot with a low budget of around $1.5 million and would be set not in modern times, but in 1851 and co-star Rocky Horror Picture Show legend Richard O'Brien. It was actually shot in the real Transylvania. It's a love letter and throwback to the Hammer Horror films that Cassandra grew up loving and also hosting as Elvira. In 2004, Elvira's Horror Classics was released on DVD via Time Life. These included single and double features, most of which were public domain. In 2007, Fox Reality TV had the search for the next Elvira, which featured Cassandra as well as Jason himself, Kane Hodder, and special effects wizard Rick Baker as guest judges. Airing on October 13th and running for a total of four episodes, the basis of the show was to find a successor as Mistress of the Dark. The winner was April Whalen. In 2009, Ghoul Town released a music video and song called Mistress of the Dark, with Elvira starring in the rocking video. In 2010, Elvira's movie Macabre came back to syndication, featuring movies in the public domain again, like Night of the Living Dead, with Elvira back to hosting duties. In 2014, Hulu joined forces with Elvira for 13 Nights of Elvira, 
which featured a number of Full Moon Entertainment films like Demonic Toys, Trancers, and Evil Bong, among others. Cassandra married Mark Pearson in 1981 and had a daughter in 94, Sadie, who was as big a sci-fi and horror fan as her mom, apparently, as she actually cosplayed Furiosa from Fury Road at one point. She and Mark would divorce in 2003. Sadly, earlier this year, Cassandra's longtime friend and collaborator, John Paragon, would pass away at the age of 66. Paragon helped create the legend that is Elvira and was also part of the movie Macabre as the breather, as well as appearing in Elvira Mistress of the Dark and The Elvira Show. Many kids my age would remember him as John B. the Genie, alongside Paul Rubens as the eternally boyish Pee Wee. Today, Cassandra is working on her biography, which will hopefully rise from the crypt this year. There are more Elvira comic books on the horizon, and she's currently working on a sequel to Elvira Mistress of the Dark. There's talk as well of an animated series, which is great, as just last year, Elvira crossed over into the land of Scooby-Doo in the animated feature Happy Halloween Scooby-Doo, with Cassandra voicing the character. Cassandra Peterson continues to embody Elvira and inspire fans all over the world. She's an icon who has celebrated the genre of horror, but also crossed boundaries. Horror icon, gay icon, Elvira is loved by everyone. She's also an inspiration for artists and women, because she's shown you can own your work and succeed. The mistress of the dark is as eternal as that very darkness and will continue to haunt your most pleasant and unpleasant dreams. So um, my first question for you is, can you talk about how the horror genre helped you during growing up and dealing with bullies and feeling different? Because I know that was a big part of your life um, when in your earlier years, and it's always felt like a safe community to me. Yeah, um, uh, it's, it's uh, I mean, horror, I have been a, a attracted to horror since I was eight years old. And I went to my first horror movie, House on Haunted Hill. Um, at the age of eight, my cousin Danny took me. I had no idea what I was in for. And it both terrified me and fascinated me. I couldn't get over uh, the movie. I just, I kept having nightmares about it. And my parents were so angry that he'd taken me because I woke up <laughs> dreaming every night. I, I would, was dreaming about Vincent Price chasing me with a big butcher knife at, every night. Oh my God, it was so weird. And then, uh, but I couldn't get it out of my mind. And I started begging my cousin to take me to more horror movies, which he did. And we basically went through all the old um, uh, Roger Corman loosely based on Vincent Price, uh, on Edgar Allan Poe, starring Vincent Price, movies like Pit in a Pendulum and, and Tomb of Ligeia, and oh my God, I don't know, all, all the rest of them for the next several years that was in the, that were in the, uh, released in the early 60s. So I became hooked. Oh, and uh, I then also somehow found a copy of Famous Monsters magazine, which in the back of it, there were models you could buy from Aurora model kits. And I, uh, my parents or, or my family got me uh, uh, Frankenstein, Dracula, and um, I can't remember if it was werewolf or mummy, but it, they bought me those and I spent the next months and months and months painting and putting those together. So I really got into it very early and have always loved it. If you had those model kits still, they'd be worth, like, you could uh, retire. <laughs> I know. My mother threw out, when they moved from our original house, she threw out so much great stuff. That and and all my autographs of different bands and their oh. drumsticks and that, all kinds of things. So that was really a bummer. Yeah, I always wish to God I had all those things. <laughs> so, and and I mentioned uh, Vincent Price. You, you'd mentioned Vincent Price there, and you've got that beautiful photo of you there with him. How was it to to actually become friends with with a legend like that? Because I, I you're a legend yourself, but it's Vincent Price. <laughs> I know. Hey, let me tell you when I when uh, we asked him here, I'll show you my little picture. I've got many many pictures with him, but I really love this one, it, and it was from um, the first appearance, the first time I ever met him, and he came on my show, Movie Macabre, which was a local TV show at that yes. time, only local here in LA. And he was appearing in a in a play uh, called Delusions and Delights, I think. I hope that's the right title. <laughs> and he it was about Oscar Wilde's life. And oh, he was wow. appearing in that one man play. And he said that he would come on my show 
and if if we allowed him to plug his play so we said hell yeah <laughs> and the next thing i know there he was trick-or-treating at my door uh on, on on the tv show and i was so nervous i was dying i was so scared i was here i was meeting him and we were doing a little bit together and he was on my show i was like this can't be happening but, oh hey oh. Oh, i just uh committed to <laughs> <laughs> Vincent's uh, like, hey, I'm the star. <laughs> oh, I don't tell you stuff yet. Okay. So um anyway, uh yeah, he was so nice and so sweet and so funny and, and fabulous that that he made me totally feel at ease. Oh, that's um, amazing. And and then we kept seeing each other over the years, over and over and over. Every time there was a any um oh my god, there weren't really convinced back then so much but there were television appearances there were award shows and every time I would go to one Vincent was always there because obviously we were traveling in the same world you know <laughs> That's and amazing. we really became very very friendly over the years um, you know I begged him to to be to play the Morgan Shepherd role that ended up being Morgan Shepherd's role of my uncle Vinny in mm -hmm. Mistress of the Dark I begged him to do that, but his wife thought it was too racy. <laughs> you know, it was PG-13. It wasn't that bad, right? It wasn't like it was a porn movie or anything. But anyway, he turned it down, sadly. Um, but but I, we remained friends until his death. Oh, that's amazing. So one thing that I wanted to talk to you about, because you you are an icon for LGBTQ and, and just, uh, you know, not just the, that group, but, every, you know, women. But especially in the gay circles, you have become an icon. And I wanted to know what it was like kind of finding a home for you in the world of drag and in the clubs um, and how that's affected you in your life. Because I have a lot of uh, gay friends that just absolutely love you. And I have one in particular that dresses up as you and, and he is amazing at it. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> can you talk about that, uh, about that uh, being mm. an icon for, for that group? Yeah, it, it was so bizarre because um, I actually started out as a teenage drag queen. Nobody <laughs> knows that. Um, you will you can read more about it in my autobiography, which is right here. And oh, it's boy, coming out it is. September 21st. <laughs> this is a uh, fake up coffee copy because the real thing is not even all printed yet. But it will be coming out from uh, Hachette publishing on September 21st and I go quite a bit into this whole uh the drag queen the the, the gay men influences on me of uh, growing up but when I was uh about 14 14 or 15 I got a gig in a club called the purple cow go-go dancing and actually one night when one of the drag queens didn't show up and I didn't even know what drag queens were I went in there and saw these glamorous women on stage and they were like oh my god i'd never seen anything like this outside of movies and and it was like oh they were so big you know and i was like what is this and i finally figured out they were men and um <laughs> one night anyway when one of them uh mr bobby didn't show up for the show uh the 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 head of the the show tawny tan uh yanked me backstage put me in a gold lame dress and um, I was flow from the Supremes. Suddenly I was uh, doing drag and people in the club just couldn't believe what an awesome drag queen I was that I looked so much like the real thing. Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah. So, so and over you, I got so influenced by so many, so many gay men and drag queens influenced me, how I looked, how I talked, how I walked, how I did my makeup, everything. I was so influenced by the by the whole gay world, my my whole life was changed by them, and now I think it's kind of come full circle. I'm actually influencing it's true. drag queens. You know? <laughs> they influenced me. Now I'm paying them back. Um, <laughs> they had, my, the the um, guy who does my social media, who is fantastic at doing all my Instagram stuff and uh, all of that, is actually in his spare time. He's an Elvira drag queen, and he's fabulous. He really is amazing. The best one. He he can talk and sing exactly like me. It, I've seen videos of him that I thought were me. And then, <laughs> and then later he goes, no, that's me. 
I'm like, oh, I'm so depressed because I looked awesome. <laughs> So, so one thing I really wanted to ask you about too, um, and I haven't gotten the opportunity to talk to you about this stuff was your work in the groundlings and how you became part of that and what it was like to create art there. Cause I mean, that was a, the, the microcosm of like so many big talents and in, including yourself. So many people have come out of that group that it is amazing. I mean, the movies, uh, film and television are just still populated with groundlings, you know, ex groundlings. If you, if you go on their website, groundlings.com and check out the archives, you won't believe how many people came out of the groundlings. So that is pretty amazing. But I was in the groundlings around, um, I think, uh, I can't remember the years off the top of my head, around 75 to 80. 76 to 80. I was there for about four, four and a half years. And uh, Lorraine Newman had just left for this brand new show called Saturday Night Live that no one had ever heard of. And and all of a sudden uh, that show took off and the Groundlings got really popular. But I was in there with Phil Hartman, speaking of Saturday Night Live, and Paul Rubens, who is Pee Wee, and um, John Paragon, who is not as well known, but John wrote not only most of my material, my yeah. whole career, um, he was my writing partner, but also Pee Wee's Playhouse and um, worked on Pee Wee's movie. So he had a huge hand in, in creating both of our characters. And he also played Jumby the Genie, the head in the box. And um, sadly, he just passed away a I couple of years ago. And I was going to ask you about John because yeah. I, oh. you were the first person that popped into my head when I heard that news. And yeah. uh, I absolutely loved everything he did all the way back to FTV way back in the 80s. And um, I just wanted to give you some time to talk about him, actually, because I he was such a big part of Elvira. Well, look, this is crazy. Uh, OK, hold on. Here's John. Oh, my Lord. Hey. There he is, John in a box. He's still in a box, John. Hey, my God. Uh, yeah, um, Pee Wee and I went out and picked up his ashes last week. And we're planning on um, uh, interring them at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. <gasps> we've been making, we've been out there looking for the perfect place to put him and we're we're thinking about putting him having a zombie box made for him oh my god put his ashes in so i know he would love that and appreciate it and fans would love to be able to go to go you know visit him so it was really hard for both paul and myself it's been really 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 intense I was, it was the first thing I thought of and, and I, I, he just influenced so much and, and is such a big part of people's lives. So it means a lot to me to see that you're taking care of him a lot. Yeah, thank you. We, yeah, we really, uh, yeah, we want to do whatever we can to make sure he has a great resting place and that he can interact with fans still because, you know, he, ugh, anyway. I'm so sorry to make you sad, <laughs> but, Thank you. but well, so one thing that I was so just doing more research on you, cause I knew a lot about you already, but one thing that I really loved hearing was how you held on to your image and you, uh, you held on to the power of that image during all this, during your career. And like, that is like super empowering to see that you were able to keep Elvira for yourself and still can, you know, make the art and be successful at it. And you were smart enough to do that. Can you talk about being able to create your brand and to own it and how that was for you? Yeah. I mean, part of it was smart. Part of it was just luck too, but, um, and, and part of it was, uh, a lot of it had to do with my managers and everything um helping me with all of that but um we were able to get the rights from the local station that i worked for and it, it was a lucky thing because had i not gotten those rights the station disappeared and and uh, elvira would have gone with them the name and the likeness so 
thank God we were able to get those rights and, um, and hang on to them so that we could do things with the character in the future, like make movies and make merchandise and, you know, uh, everything else I've done. Otherwise I wouldn't be able to. And, or I'd be like one of the characters say from Star Trek who uh, can go out on the road and they can sign autographs, but they cannot, uh, the, the film studio still gets a cut of that money and they cannot make their own merchandise. They can't do anything with that character. Um, I was just hearing a story about the monkeys. You remember the monkeys? Oh, yeah. And of course, they were owned by CBS, I believe. And they, they, if they went out on tour in their later years, um, the, the CBS would take all the money and they would be paid like about $1,500 a week. I mean, oh my God. poverty wages. So they just decided not to tour. That's, this is what I've heard anyway. Um, but that's what, it, that's what it's like when somebody else owns your particular character. You can't really exploit it or make money off of it. So I'm one of these super lucky people, maybe that uh, Paul, Pee Wee, and I always say we're in the most exclusive club on earth. Um, <laughs> and because it's he and I, and we have these wacky characters and we own the rights to them. So I don't know that there's that many other people around that, that I can really say that about. Maybe you could say Gene Simmons from Kiss or, or Alice Cooper, but they're really um, in a kind of a different realm, you know, because they're in music. So yeah, it was just a really, really lucky, lucky thing. I never realized it until kind of later on, like, oh man, thank God I got those rights. Wow. Well, and one thing I wanted to ask you, because you've had such just a, a crazy career, you've, you've done so much amazing stuff. What is one big achievement you've accomplished that stands out for you in your career? And what is one you want to achieve yet that you haven't? Ew, one that I've accomplished, well, probably making Mistress of the Dark, you know, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, making that movie. I mean, that was a dream come true. And I was so lucky to be able to do that. Uh, NBC financed it and they wanted to make a sitcom. And I was adamant that I wanted to make a film before a sitcom because back then you could be in a film and move to TV, but you but actors could not be in a TV series and then go on to be a film actor. It just didn't happen. Nowadays it's pretty it's interchangeable. <clears throat> but I really, really, really wanted to make make that movie. And so I would say that maybe is my greatest accomplishment. Um, my next accomplishment I'm really excited about, which is again, my own <laughs> um, which took me, I started thinking about doing it 15 years ago and I'd write down little bits and pieces for the book over the years, over the years. And then about three years ago, I really got serious about, I need to do this. I need to get it together. And I started working on it five days a week, all day long. Um, and it took me three years and that's finally coming out. So that was a big deal. Um, something I have not yet complete. And, and I, by the way, I wrote it completely on my own. No, no ghostwriter, no, no, nothing. Nobody. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm pretty proud of that. Just getting all that down. Um, I'd still big accomplishments. I don't know. That's one of, one of my accomplishments that I've always dreamed about doing and I'm finally actually doing it. So we'll see how that goes. I'm crossing my fingers. Oh, I'm buying it. <laughs> I can tell you that. Actually, I'm free sale right now on barnesandnoble.com or Amazon. If you must go to Amazon, it, it's uh, uh, a lot of places online for pre sale right now. But I think my fans in particular will really enjoy it. But like you were talking about a little bit ago about crossover, mm -hmm. I think um, women who have had a lot of experience with, uh, well, how should I put this? sexual harassment uh, will relate. Uh, women who have been in abusive relationships will relate. Um, uh, all kinds of other, other things. So I think it kind of uh, crosses over into that. It's obviously, I talk about Elvira a lot and horror, but my earlier life was pretty damn interesting. I think people will be a little bit scared and shocked. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I can't wait to read it. Oh my God! Now, it's really, got your sex, it's got your violence, it's got your nudity, it's got everything in there. Yes. 
Um, so quick question, are, is there going to be an audiobook version? There is, and I just yes. was recording it last week. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. It was <laughs> five days, eight hours a day of reading, and then reading the line, you'd start a sentence like, I was born 30, oh, wait, could we, we heard you uh, slur a word. You I was born as a little, oh wait, we heard you, there was a sibilant S. I was born, and that would go on for like 20 times, maybe to one sentence. So it took me five days, eight hours of reading. And they actually said, I did better than many people who, who did it. I did it quicker because I've had experience acting. A lot of people who do it are authors uh, only and they read their own books and they've never done something like that before. So it was excruciating, even for me who was used to doing voiceovers and stuff, absolutely excruciating. Oh, I, I like it. Uh, I've I've learned narration, and it's it is not. Yeah, <laughs> I can relate to the pain of doing that. Um, so one thing that uh, I I know that you worked on recently, and I absolutely loved, was Happy Halloween Scooby Doo. Yeah. And the word is you're working on an animated feature or um, something with Elvira, and I wondered if you could give any kind of details about that at all i am working on an animated thing with elvira i don't know i think <laughs> i don't think so that's oh, sad i, I don't aww. think I am. oh my god i'm not kidding you uh, heard i am oh i hope i am <laughs> i would be so down for an animated tv yeah. series of elvira <laughs> we've been talking for years about doing an animated feature of elvira but that has not really yet come about i'm still interested in it i'm still pitching it and all these things I do, like Scooby-Doo and, and all the various other voiceover for cartoon things that I do, I think help, you know, prop me up for that. Um, but hasn't come about yet, but it is something I would love to do. Yes. Okay. Universe, it's out there now. You can make it happen. Make us, get us an Elvira cartoon. I'm pretty good at manifesting, so. Yes. I like it. Um, so uh, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you not only about your projects, I know the book is coming and I'm really excited about that, but I wondered what you could talk about the fact that horror hosts have kind of come full circle and they're coming back again, like in the big way in the public eye, thanks to comic books like Count Crowley and just, you know, online access too. And, and you're, you've done work with Hulu. Can you talk about you know, like the resurgence of Joe Bob Briggs and things like that. It's such a neat thing to see. How does that make you feel yeah. as being an icon of that? I'm thrilled. I, I am so happy because there were um, several years ago, I was pretty sure that horror hosts were going the way of the dinosaur. Um, I tried like mad to get a TV show going, hosting horror movies again after mine uh, ended. And you cannot get those movies. That One of the big, big problems is those libraries of the old awesome films that I love have been bought up by huge, huge conglomerates. And um, you can't get a hold of those libraries of films unless some big, big company owns them and hires, hires you to host them. Um, you know, it's the only way to do it. And it, and it, it really, I thought this is, the, this is the end of horror hosting. It just can't ever happen again because people can't get the rights to show the movies. I did a couple things where I used, um, I did my new movie macabre series, which we filmed using um, public domain movies that were out there. And even that was really, really damn hard to get. And it cost me at least 10,000 bucks for each of those movies to, to remaster them and make them even viewable so that, because they were in such bad shape. Oh, wow. Um, but, I could not be more thrilled to see horror hosting kind of coming back and doing more things. I'm so thrilled with Joe Bob Briggs on, on Shudder and, and um, Svengoolie and, and all of that. Uh, I'm so happy. And, and I may even have, you never know, something could be coming up for Elvira. Remember her? <laughs> <laughs> you, you're a tease. <laughs> So before I let you go, I wanted to give you a chance to pimp everything that you've got upcoming. I know, um, again, please show that beautiful cover of that book. And so we can see it. 
<laughs> I love the wink. Um, but but uh, yeah, what else do you have upcoming that you can actually tell us about? And I love that book. That cover um, is so cute. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, the, the well, I have several projects coming up this September and October. I think I'm doing more, uh, more things than I've ever done in one year. I really am. Unfortunately, I cannot talk about them yet because uh, they haven't, you know, given me the dates where we, we you know, kind of can do that. Can do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, so I have to think quiet. But so you have things coming. <laughs> So, yes, I have lots of things coming for this uh, September, October. I think you're going to be, uh, I know I'm very happy. I cannot wait. I'm thrilled. Yay. And I, again, I'm so um, happy for you for the book. I know everybody is going to love that. And I can't, I'm going to get the audio book because you, you have a way with telling stories and, and um, I love I it. I hope I do. It was intense. <laughs> I hope so. I, did, I had to quit, stop myself from crying all the time. It was unbelievable i don't know why it got so emotional but yeah thank you for watching our show if you like what you see please subscribe to our joe blow videos channel tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support